such a waste. Looking on the city lights. Hello and welcome to the Ken McElroy <laughs> Show. I'm your host, Daniil, here with Ken. What's up? How are you guys? How are you? Good. You were gone all weekend. I was. Where were you at? Well, I was back on Saturday. You were. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, doing some personal development. It was so fun. Yeah. Yeah. I go every year, a uh, f- few days of deep dive on uh, strategy mostly. So it's good. To try to get clear on my direction. Nice. Nice. Um, so I have another flood at my condo. Another flood, everybody. Just had a flood last month. Another flood this month. And I was telling Ken that my plumber just called and he's going to fix the P-trap. And Ken said he could have done that. And I was wondering <laughs> why he doesn't do that. And what did you say? First of all, <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> yes. I, as you guys, I don't know if you guys know, my background is uh, my dad was in construction. And I, we, you know, we never had a maintenance guy at our house. And he was in the Seabees in the Navy, and so he could do everything. And so I learned under him for years and years and years. So I could do all that, plumbing, electrical, all that kind of stuff. But I don't want to. (laughs) That's the bottom line. Right. So I'm married to someone handy, but it's of no benefit to me. (laughs) (laughs) I just don't, you know, I used to do all that stuff. I used to mow my lawn and do all those kinds of things on the weekends. But I like to relax on the weekends. I know. I'm just kidding, kind of. So, But... Anyways, time so, is money. money. Yeah, money is a claim on your time. By the way, we're, we're going to start talking about that today. Yeah. This is a big topic. Well, it is, and you know, I think of stuff like that too. Like, I have friends that own Airbnbs, and like my one friend, she still cleans all her Airbnbs, and I'm like, you know, like it really is a claim on your time. Like, you really should be paying somebody to do that, so you're not spending your Mondays flipping units and stuff like that. But I totally agree, having to do that initially, you know, having to go through that process maintenance cleaning i did all that painting renting all those things you have to kind of do that so that when you hire somebody else to do it you know how to manage them well and that is true because um even for me like with the plumbers that i got this last time they you know they initially told me it was a dishwasher so i replaced the dishwasher because i assumed that they were right and then 400 dollars later an 800 hundred dollar bill still have water so if I would know a little bit about a little bit and even like the air conditioning guys that a few months ago wanted to replace the whole unit and you said that didn't sound right. So I got a second opinion and it wasn't, it was like a very inexpensive fix. Those are the kind of things that you get taken advantage of. Experience, experience, even the hot water heater we had blow out recently. Uh, Oh, at the house. The one bit was 800 more than another. Yeah. So, and the same thing, uh, we're getting our house painted and, uh, you know, the, the painting bid was, uh, almost 10,000 less. Yeah. So uh, these are things you got to bid that stuff out, but you also, once you find those, you know, those handyman or the, you know, or company or whatever that's gold, man, make sure you pay them on time and quick. Yeah, exactly. The quicker you pay them, the better. <laughs> yeah. What you want is we, we have, uh, we have one guy that comes came and said, I don't think that's what you need. I think you need something, you know, a little less expensive yeah. and this will actually work. That's who you want. Exactly. That's exactly what you want. Um, so let's jump in. Before we jump into the topic today, you know, we want to really break down inflation and the economy today and what's really happening but versus what we're being told is happening. But before we do that, let's jump into our Twitter question of the week. Um, Ken, you asked, with experts advising people to move away from the dollar, what things do you feel are safe to invest in right now? You know, that's a good question. Uh, by the way, I'm doing a... a um, a Zoom with George Gammon in one hour, and then uh, we're going to do a couple, one on the 27th and then one in May with uh, Mark Moss and Chris Martinson and Joseph Wang. So this is a big, hot topic. Yeah, and, and uh, James replied to the question, you still need a mixture of things, short-term T-bills, gold and silver, uh, and art could be good if you know what you're doing, but don't put anything yep. in one thing. Don't I put agree. everything yep. in one thing. I agree with that. So, yeah, I just had this conversation recently. You know, T-bills are paying, what are they today, Jerry? About four? Yeah, four. So, you know, four and a half maybe even? So, question is, is for all the effort that you have to buy a piece of real estate, manage it, make sure it's rented, uh, pay the bills and all that kind of stuff, the cash flow, are you getting that? You know, that's really the question, right? Exactly, yes. So, you know, it's uh, sometimes it's just easy to put that into a, 
a T-bill or, or a high uh, interest account, you know, like we're doing. We're doing uh, nightly sweeps on our account. I think we're getting four and a quarter. Or, yeah, four and a quarter, which I know we can get out uh, a little bit more, but the bank was afraid of us pulling our pulling our business, you know, after all the banking stuff. So uh, we ended up uh, getting a pretty good rate, but it sweeps every night. And it's a fair amount of money, by the way. <laughs> You know, you think about how much real estate we got, uh, you know, a billion dollars of real estate. We have a lot of reserves. So um, millions and millions of dollars that are uh, being uh, swept every night into a high interest account. So if you guys aren't doing that, you got to do that. So then you got to look at, you know, what's the alternative, right? Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. And Steve, if we could see the next question. Uh, Alan said, in my opinion, and this is a great time to have some dry powder, select commodities and energy will do well, but a market sell-off will bring down even good companies in the short term. Yeah. Really depends on your econo economic outlook. I'm bearish. I actually agree with Alan. I, you know, the dry powder is where it's at right now, guys. Like, first of all, I think I could be wrong here. I think but the last time when, when we actually got the, the, uh, control of the dollar was the Bretton Woods in 44. Um, I think it took 30 years or something like, you know, for them to lose it. So, you know, this is a process, you know, we've obviously been eroding the dollar for a while and we've been printing a lot and countries, yes, are upset with us. There's no question about that because for those of you who might not know, the world is basically traded in U.S. dollars. So if there's oil um, or goods, you know, being traded they're, they're in u.s dollars the reason is if you think about it like we're going to talk about argentina a little bit but let's say that you're you manufacture something in argentina and you sell it to the u.s you want u.s dollars you know so 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 you know from other countries looking at the u.s dollar they look at our dollar as a safe haven because you know, if you have to walk, you have to go outside of the country to understand the turmoil that's going on in a lot of other places. Um, and so uh, you have to look at it from that perspective, not from our perspective looking out. And so what that means is um, for years and years and years, people would be heavy in dollars because it's been relatively stable over a long period of time. Now, with everything that's happening, it's been going on slowly, but now obviously the pandemic and everything else and the printing um, and these bailouts, the, the the rest of the world is looking at an alternative. That's really the issue. And I just think it's going to take a while. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jerry, do you want to put up the last comment here? So extreme real estate investor said, I'd still look at well-positioned real estate. I'm slowly buying positions in gold and Bitcoin. Realistically, it will take years for the dollar to get removed as a real currency, which you just said. And it will take a lot of time to unwind things. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to that. And, and that's one of the questions. That's one of the things we're going to get into with George Gammon. If you don't watch, if you don't watch George Gammon, you got to watch his stuff. Uh, this is next level stuff. This is, you know, makes me look like I'm in Little League compared to, you know, <laughs> speaking to George about this stuff. But, you know, he's, he d dives deep. I would definitely follow his stuff. Uh, but he's right. It, it's going to take a long, long, long time uh, for any of this stuff to happen. I think one of the things you might want to look at is, the central banks around the world, just type this into Google, central banks buying gold, 2022, 2023. You'll be blown away because the central banks have been getting out of dollars. I'm talking about around the world and buying gold at a pretty high rate. So that should tell you something. They're, they're diversifying from the U.S. dollar into other kinds of assets. So as I, as I like to say, don't fight the Fed be the Fed. <laughs> well, know? and it's interesting. We have Rodrigo from YouTube just commented, I'm from Chile and the USD has definitely become a safe haven. Any noise around USD, USD is not relevant here. Yep. So, that's, that's my point. Well, and I don't know about Chile, but I know Argentina, you know, to talk today is 110% uh, is what they're gauging their inflation is going to be in 2023. So, I mean, it, their currency is not a safe haven, right. you know, and normal people can't just go grab gold. So, you know, they're going to, they need things they can actually pay for and exchange with. And the USD is kind of that. The other thing is that people might not know there's more money outside of the U S by a long shot. than More in, USD. Than, or, yeah. More USD outside of the United States than there are, than there is inside. So think about that. That means a lot of people are holding dollars. So it's, for whatever reason right now, considered a safe haven for the world. 
but people are getting pissed at us. Uh, just look at BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, uh, Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South America, and now Saudi Arabia. And I, I think there's been other people that are trying to join. Uh, right now, Mexico is trying to join. So uh, I think there's 26 or 27 countries now that are, that are joining. Just follow that. And that's actually what we're going to talk a lot about that at Limitless. In fact, I was talking to Tarl this morning. I said, we really, really, really got to have a great panel around this BRICS thing, around what's, what could happen um, with the U.S. Reserve, because we are the world's reserve currency. What could happen? What are some of the pros, cons, what should we be looking at? So that's we're going to discuss that uh, um, all morning, Friday morning. At, uh, at Limitless here uh, at our conference on uh, June 15th through 17th. Yeah, and let's put that up, Jerry, for everybody, the Limitless Expo. Uh, now's the time to get your tickets. They are less expensive. They are going to go up at the end of April. Um, they're here in the desert. Make a vacation out of it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, if you guys, listen, June is hot, but it's nice by the pool, and you're going to be inside during the day. So, you know, evenings are amazing. So, yep. Oh, and then use code KEN10 for an extra 10% off. Yep, yep. Thanks. Thanks, okay. Jerry. So anyway, so let's hop into the topic today. Um, so we're going to be talking about, you know, inflation and the economy and how that's going to affect the real estate market. And what we really want to dive into as well is what's really happening with inflation and really happening with the economy. So, you know, over the past three years, you know, people are starting to believe the lie that prices are never going to come down. So I'm sure you've all heard that. I've heard people say it. Oh, this market's no longer affordable. I missed the boat. You know, it's never going to be affordable again. And, you know, they were saying the same thing in 06, 07. And I think it's important to understand that, that markets are cyclical. Ken's been through a lot of different market cycles. And they do, they go up, you know, and they go down. Well, I just want to point out one thing. Nobody under the age of 50 is saying that. Or I'm sorry, or over the age of 50. <laughs> Nobody over the age of 50 is saying that, that right. the prices aren't going to come down. It's just everyone just had this great little run. And uh, I'm just saying it's pure wisdom. Right, Jerry? Yes. We've seen ups and we've seen downs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, in a lot of the country, we are seeing prices fall. And we're getting a lot of comments from you that your area, you know, isn't falling, which can be true because there's parts of the Midwest. There's certain segments of the country where prices aren't falling. But I also think some of you haven't jumped on Zillow and really deep dived because there is a lot of price cuts. Like I looked up a lot of different markets over the past week and was really looking at Zillow. And, and what we're seeing in Phoenix and what we're seeing around a lot of the country is your more luxury homes have started to come down with bigger price cuts. But now your more starter homes that went up a lot over the past two years are starting to have small price cuts five, ten, twenty thousand dollars. But they're only doing that because they're trying to kind of notify everybody because the house is still for sale. You know, they're trying to get another email blast out. You know, on Zillow they have, you know, the updated um, listings. They're trying to get on that. So that's and we even saw the one house that was listed one dollar cheaper. <laughs> but uh, you know, so you're starting to see a lot of that. So you really, really if you're telling me your area is not dropping I just, and you might be right, but I do encourage you to get on Zillow and really start looking because it seems to be in Phoenix, the ones that aren't dropping are the ones that have just listed. So you either saw like an open house or a price drop and there was really no in between on that. There's a few things I think you need to consider. First of all, the commercial market, real estate market has already dropped, period. Because it, it, it's directly, it directly valued based on interest rate increases. The residential market is very different, obviously. So um, what what you're going to see first in the residential market are, are, are uh, longer days on market. So that's the first indicator, longer days on market. So everybody got spoiled when there are bidders and all these, all the stuff, everybody's showing up trying to buy stuff. Okay, those, that is that would be what I would consider to be the peak. So now you just watch days on market. And what's going to happen is every market is unique. So, and, and again, real estate exists for people. So no people, market drop. <laughs> Lots of people, um, maybe even increasing. So, you know, the people drive prices. 
So if there's lots of buyers in an area because there's lots of people moving there, stands the reason that that market is going to be strong. If there's a big employer moving somewhere or moving out, it's going to go up or down based on the amount of people. So you got to start with the people, the migration patterns. Um, I was reading this interesting article. This is very interesting. Listen to this. So you know how we always talk about the U-Haul, you know, U-Haul has does these great study of where are people moving, you know, so you can actually say, I want a one way trip from Seattle to Phoenix. Okay. That's a data point. You can actually track that. Um, you can do the same thing with out of state driver's licenses. So there's all kinds of ways to see who's moving where, you know, becoming a permanent resident, et cetera. And they're all just slightly different. There's a U-Haul on their website right now. It, there's almost a 50% discount. Listen to this from Dallas to San Francisco. Oh, wow. So, why would that be? Because there's so many trucks in Dallas, they need them back. So it's interesting to me, you know, nobody wants to go to San Francisco as an example, obviously, uh, per the, U, uh, the U-Haul website, just go take a look. So the point is, when you start to see those kinds of things, you start to, when people move places, it puts demand and stress on that area period, on the schools, on the restaurants, on the rents, on the houses, on everything else. So you, you have to know that and as they go the other way, then it, it has the opposite effect. So that's actually what's gonna drive this. And the other thing, of course, uh, are real estate, um, I'm sorry, interest rates. Interest rates are another factor. They just kind of put that knife in that equity. You know, if you, got, if you go to a house and you have 3% debt on it or two and a half, you're not selling. You're not refinancing right now. What did you say? HELOCs or? Yeah, I was looking at HELOCs this weekend, and they're at between eight and ten percent. Yeah. Okay. So nobody's gonna nobody's gonna trade out a three percent um, debt and then put you know borrow eight or ten percent money on your on your own equity just to get access to it so you can buy the market when the you know when the knife is still falling. So that's actually what's happening. So just be careful. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and there's a lot of talk and I wanted to go over this about the interest rates. Um, you know, there's everyone keeps saying, you know, we had touched on this a couple weeks ago. It's going to go down. It's going to go down. It's going to go down. And instead of just listening to the news, what you need to understand is why interest rates are up and why they would either go up or down. Because if you understand the why, you can sort through all the noise of, oh, they're going to go down or, oh, they're going to go up or what you'll be able to think for yourself. I mean, that's what we always tell people to do is understand like the cash flow of real estate. So you're not just believing somebody that says this is a good deal or this isn't a good deal. Well, it's the same thing on inflation. You need to understand, you know, with the rates, like how it's tied to inflation and based on the information, what rates are going to do. And I think that's why it's so apparent to us what they have to do because we understand the why behind it. Well, the, one of the best things you could do is if your mortgage... Uh, broker says, oh, rates are going down next month. The very best thing you could ask is why? <laughs> and then just keep your mouth shut and right. watch them stammer. <laughs> you know, they, they don't have any reason other than I sure hope it does. Now, in some cases, they might be able to back it up with something, but normally it, it can't, this is not a gut feel issue. When you, when you're, when you're at five, six percent inflation rate, um, and the fed says that they want it down to two, and they've raised it nine times already. Um, you know, tell me why. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you're enjoying your content, make sure you hit the like button. I forgot to say that earlier. Always helps us out. Yeah, but you do have to look at why. And if you look, the National Association of Realtors. I, well, let me guess. And you the Mortgage Banker me. Association. They're going down. Yeah, it keeps saying yeah, rates yeah, are going to go down. It, so, Larry, Larry Fink with Black Rockets. They're going down. Right. Of course, well, of course he's going to say that. Like, he's got all these investors and everybody's got all these clients. Of course they're going to do that. Right, exactly. And, you know, um, you know, they need to give, you know, they need to give the mortgage brokers and the realtors and everybody some hope, you know, like if they said, Oh, we don't know. Like if the, if the national association of realtors came out and said, yeah, rates could be up for the next few years. It's probably going to be a pretty slow, you know, time. Cause a lot of realtors are in trouble right now because the market's so stagnant. Then that's not really, 
you know, it's like going into battle with troops and being like, yeah, we're probably not going to win, but it's going to be pretty tough. Like they're just trying to keep their hope up, you know? And so, and then that's what they tell you because they look to their association because most of them don't do their own research. And so they're just really hoping rates go down. Well, well, you know, here's the thing, you guys, you got to be careful here. And because I understand this, you know, uh, by the way, I want rates to go down. I want to make that clear. Of course I want them to go down, but all the fundamentals don't point that way, except for the inverted yield curve, which is what George Gammon's going to be talking about which is very, very, very interesting. But it doesn't look to me like uh, there is one potential issue that could keep rates flat at this next uh, Fed at this next Fed meeting. And that is that the banks, because of the, the, the couple, uh, the few that that um, that went down, the banks are tightening their underwriting. What that means is they're, you know, and, and one of the biggest, three of the biggest issues for inflation are housing, automobiles, and food, and um, and and wage growth is as another one they're concerned about. So those are all on their radar, and you know you just I want them to go down, guys. I do. I want rates to go down. Everything gets better when rates go down. But if rates go down, the Fed will start to see a inflation again because when rates go down people start to buy and then prices will go uh, start to go up again that's how it works well and the fed really has to keep control of inflation so that is going to be the number one thing you know a lot of us are investors so we just look at the rates where your average american is a renter and they don't really care about the rates or maybe they're already a homeowner and they care more about inflation they care about how much their groceries have been their gas has been and how much their rent is right and as we're seeing in argentina when the government lets inflation get away and rents are at 110 percent or i'm sorry inflation's at 110 percent you know what that affects is that affects the people on fixed income so it affects you know seniors and people that are on welfare because they don't have enough money to pay for all their things and that's what's happening in argentina is there's not enough money for rent medicine and food and so the government has inflation infects everybody um you know rates don't affect everybody so they have to really focus on that and the only way that the fed can get down inflation or have a chance to is to higher rates right and make lend you know make right. borrowing money more expensive because it doesn't just hire mortgage rates it hires credit card rates it hires auto loans it makes it more expensive to spend money so you got to think of it this way cheap money creates velocity of money and that velocity creates inflation so cheap money people buy more cars cheap money people buy more houses you know things that are financed so that's how you have to think. So when the Fed raises rates, it slows that down. So that's what they're trying to do. That's what higher interest rates do, is it slows things down so that the inflation's come down. And it has come down. I mean, we were we were 9.1 last June, and um, I think we're still, what, somewhere between five, five, six. So it's come down, and that's good. We want that. We want inflation down. So. But I just don't think that we're going to see lower rates. See, there's there's three things happening. The first one is, if rates stay the same, according to everyone, they're still too high. They're not going to lower rates at the next Fed meeting. So the question is, do they increase them or not? Even if they don't, uh, they're still... It, you know, you're still going to start to see prices continue to erode because um, you, the, there's a lag effect, as we've talked about many times here. They say that an interest rate increase can take one to three years to show up in an economy. So that's what's happening now. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, everyone keeps banking on these lower rates and it's just it's going to be a long time. I mean, like you said, whether or not they decide to raise rates or keep them the same, you know, these are the rates now and the rates really aren't that high right now. I mean, rates in the 80s were at 13, 14 percent, but the prices are high. And that's exactly. where that's the, issue. the issue is. The issue isn't really the rate. It's the prices. Guys, of the homes. Historically, these are still fine rates. The problem mm -hmm. is, is the asset price is high. So that's why I think asset prices are going to come down. 
is, you, you know, and that's just the way it is. There's a lot of equity in people's houses. So, okay. So if I'm the Fed, I'm going to go, you know, they, that equity, equity can come down a little bit. You know, these prices are coming down, guys. So there's a there's an interesting comment here by Shuffle Does on uh, YouTube, and they're asking, so if the Fed rate heights bump bump up, and it you know slows lending, will they fall just as fast if they stop raising and they start lowering rates? So I understood the first part. What was the second so part? So basically, if they lower rates again, if they start to lower rates, oh. will the spending increase just as dramatically? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know how quickly, you know, like if it goes from six to five and three quarters or five and a half, is that really going to jumpstart the economy? Probably not. Um, so I don't know. Well, the other thing that happens too, and we saw this in 08, 09, is the, the, the bank lowered if if they higher rates and put us into a true recession, which is what you know it looks like they seem to be doing. Then even if when we go into a recession, sometimes they lower rates to kind of get the economy going. Correct. But then people can't borrow, so it won't really matter if there's low rates if you can't borrow. So maybe you just lost your job or you just started a new job and you don't have your two years of tax returns, we're already seeing the banks getting much tighter on lending than they used to be. You know, they were lending 70 to 75% loan to value on commercial. And now it's looking more like 55 to 60% loan to value on commercial. So as the banks tighten, you might be able to get a good rate if you can get a loan. Yeah. Well, let's not forget one other very, very important piece the, we have gone from record savings to record debt in just two years. Talking about people. Mm -hmm. So let me say that again. M America has gone from record savings to record debt in two years. That's a fact. So people are 30% more in debt now than they were since the pandemic. 30%. Yeah. Okay, so you have that. That's number one. Number two. We're at 3.5, 3.6% unemployment, let's say. The Fed doesn't like that because that's wage growth, that's inflationary. So if they force an unemployment more, if they do, which is what they're saying they're trying to do, that actually makes that worse. That actually makes that debt number worse because you take a look at all kinds of debt, credit card debt especially, now especially with 20%, the average credit card um, is uh, over 20%, I looked. Um, for the first time ever in the history of America, we are $1 trillion, that's a T, in debt, on credit card debt. Just Google it, you'll see. How, just to say, um, you know, how heavy in debt are, uh, uh, from credit cards are we? You'll see, you'll see it, ju it jumped 8% in January. So people are used, people are blown through their savings, and they're they're actually taking their credit cards and they're actually trying to live more. And that's showing up right now in all the data. So you have that. Um, so that's a really important piece because to Daniil's point, people are getting more and more and more strapped. And so as they're more and more strapped, they start to cut down. And I'll tell you guys, you're not going to save your way out of this. You have to figure out, you have to have an abundant mindset as opposed to a scarcity mindset. You know, cutting out an extra Starbucks in the morning or, you know, or, or your gym membership or Netflix is not going to get you there. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. But the point is, this is real stuff. You know, the, these inflation numbers look like they're going to be here for a while. You have to come up, you have to figure out side hustle money. You have to. This is the way you're going to, you're going to get ahead. You got to think of revenue, not cutting expense. I grew up my, with my parents. It's all about scarcity, scarcity, scarcity. So I do understand what it's like, you know, cutting out things to, to, to make ends meet. This is not going to help at this point. You, you Inflation is too high. You have to run with an abundance mindset here. You have to. The, this is all, you, you know, the, the genie's out of the bottle here, guys. Justin said, J.P. Morgan's loving this banking issue. Three-month treasury is at 5%. So How about that? Yeah. Guys, like a 5%. Guys were raising money to buy real estate at 5%. 
Yeah. Okay. What would you rather do? <laughs> Put money in a three month treasury guaranteed by the government or, you know, or hand it over to somebody and try to get 5% cash on cash. Um, you know, yeah. so that you think about the savings rates are competing against investment too right now. Yeah. And, and, you know, let's break down the economy a little bit, because all we hear about is how strong our economy is and how consumer spending is at a record high. And I think some of us, you know, most of us that are dealing with this inflation are kind of wondering and trying to understand that. So if you really if you really dig into it, the way the government is trying to make things sound is consumer spending's at a record high. People are buying cars and boats and vacations and everything else. But re really what it's saying is that people aren't really doing that right now. They're digging into their savings and they're using their credit cards not to go on vacation, but to be able to afford cost of living. And their groceries are more expensive and their gas is more expensive and their rent is more expensive. So consumer spending is an all time high, but it's not for fun things that consumers want to spend money on. It's for the things that they need. So it is skewed to say the economy is great because consumer spending is at an all time high. And you're not seeing the results of that right now because people do have savings, you know, and people do have credit card balances. So they're basically just using all of that. But in the next 6, 12, 18 months, you know, the savings are going to be gone. The credit card balances are going to be too much to bear. The credit card rates keep going up and people are in really hot water and it's going to really start to show up in the economy. Guys, like credit card balances are way up. I, I'm going to call this the great money reset. <laughs> That's what I'm going to call it. The great money reset. Because you, how do you go from record savings to record debt in two years? That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Basically, what that means is people had a lot. But when the stimmy checks were out and all that money was pouring out <coughs> there with in, you know, all the different kinds of PPP loans and EIDL, I, I, whatever it is, I, EIDL, I think it is. You know, all that kind of stuff. All that money that was thrown around to people and businesses and all that kind of stuff. And it was cheap at the time. Don't forget. Interest. Um, we had record savings, and that actually is good. You know, people should have a buffer. But now we've gone to record debt in two years. That's pretty That's pretty mind-blowing that, that we can increase our debt by 30% since the pandemic. Don't you think? Absolutely. And I wanted to look, because I know what some of you are thinking. I think that you're thinking, oh, well, you know, you're saying that because everyone got all the stimulus money and everything else. But I was looking last night and I had texted you. So savings rates in 2019, so before any of this even started, were 8.83%. So that's where we were. And it was actually, you know, a really, they, they were saying that was a pretty high number. Yep. People are doing pretty well. And now we're at 3.3%. So what that means is out of the, the average American, out of the whole salary, they're able to save 3.3%. Of their money in their... Um, Think about it. Yeah. 60% of America is, is paycheck to paycheck right now. Well, and 3.3% is basically paycheck to paycheck because that's going to cover one maybe event and that's going to wipe out your savings. Yeah. When before, you know, when they were at almost 9%, that's, all, that's significantly more. That's three times more money that they were saving. So... And things have gotten more expensive. So I I think that, you know, we haven't seen savings rates of 3.3 since the Great Depression. So I think no matter what anybody says, we're, st we're on a trajectory. I mean, these people are going to be in trouble. And so the point of that is like, there's only so much. So when you look at the real estate market and we're, we're betting that prices are going to go down, you have to look at the rates, but you have to look at the supply and demand. So... If people are only saving 3.3% of their savings and they're dipping into their savings account to live, a lot of people's savings account is their down payment. You know, like they're, you know, they're saving up for a house, but now they're dipping into that to just pay for groceries, gas, doctor's visits, whatever. And so there's going to be less people that are going to be able to actually buy a home even if rates go down. And if there's not as much of a demand and there's more of a supply coming to the market, you're going to have a decrease in real estate prices. Yep. And those are the things you guys have to look at when you say, oh, the, you know, the markets are not going to go down. They're going to keep going up or rates are going to come down or, you know, you have to understand the why. And the, the economy 
is not doing great right now, no matter what you're told. And that can really affect the real estate market, not right away, but over time as people are draining their bank accounts or upping their credit cards. Yeah, people are handcuffed right now. They're handcuffed. You know, debt is, debt at 20%, that's horrible. What well, instead of the Biden administration forgiving student debt, they should, they should wipe that out because that, that, would, that would immediately jumpstart the economy. People can't afford that kind of debt payment. They're not even paying their principal. They're just paying the 20%. I think the average, I looked uh, the other day, the average is 7,800. That's a lot. 7800 so at 20%, that's, what, 150 a month of interest or something like that? So, you know, these are these are not insignificant numbers. Well, and, Carlos and, brought up something good yeah. on YouTube. He said, you know, cash out refinancing is out too. Because I think a lot of people have been cash out refinancing on these low rates. And that's not really an option either now that people are locked into low rates and if they need money, they're going to be paying significantly more for it. Well, let's just go back two years ago. Look at everything that everybody was uh, puffing their chest out about, like cash out refis. You know, you had the market going up. You had cheap money. Bitcoin was going crazy. You know, it seemed like anybody could do anything. And, you know, there was money to be made. Uh, name one thing now. Right. Just one. You know, this is the opposite. This is, you know, that's why asset p prices need to deflate a little bit, guys. I've seen this. I've been through a couple of times. I've been through this a couple of times, including 07, 08. And uh, while it's not exactly the same, um, you know, th there's, um, it, it's still, it still is coming down. And we're, by the way, we're already seeing defaults on the commercial side. So that's the other thing that you need to pay attention to. Yeah. And even um, Deering said, if you're in commercial real estate, start your emergency exit plan for your rate adjustments. Correct. Because, you know, you're only usually locked into five to 10 year loans. There's an article that came out today on a guy that I've been following that um, I won't mention the name, but he's he's he he bought right around 30,000 units and he's looking to sell the whole company right now because he bought a bunch of stuff in the last two years. Now, I don't know the complexity of, you know, what's going on behind the curtain there, but it's an interesting time when for sure multifamily is down 20 to 25% for him to, to put that portfolio out there. And it means that in the last couple of years, he's in huge trouble with cash calls, rate cap issues, and um, negative cash flow. Yeah. So it's coming, guys. It's starting, you know, this is stuff that, that's the, 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 those are the areas that I study. Uh, we saw another group out of Texas last week. Toxic real estate, um, big trouble, didn't buy any rate caps. Um, and, um, you know, behind the scenes, a lot of stuff's not even getting listed yet. So the well, sharks are out there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that brings us to Carlos's question. He's asking, how much of a de decrease do you think the real estate market will be in a year from now? It depends on what rates do. Yeah. So I wish I could answer directly. Well, but the economy and everything else. Yeah, but if it, so, so it's not a direct correlation, but as rates went up, cap rates went up. So capitalization rate, um, you know, I've done a couple of videos on that if you want to take a look at what that is. But as cap rates go up from four to five, that's a 20% discount in the, in the value of the property, all things being equal. So, you know, that's how you have to look at it. So if rates continue to go up, or even if they stay the same, what's going to happen is we'll start to see that train coming and hitting soon, you know? Yep, absolutely. Um, Shuffle says, I've heard and seen some big players dumping rentals and going into the um, going up into big land up here in the Wyoming area. Oh, yeah. Or Wisconsin area. Yeah, that's kind of the new thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting time, you know, like there's a lot of people, you know, I was doing some um, some calls with some of our investors this morning. And one of the biggest things that kept coming up is, you know, are you guys buying right now, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it's just it's we're always looking, but it is a hard time to buy right now. And um, and you really have to find the right deals. But what I told them is, you know, we're waiting for all of these things to kind of start to come to fruition, you know, yep. and um 
And at the end of the day, like patience is key, right? Guys, listen, like if you made money in the last 10 years, congratulations. I made most of mine when the market had fallen and I started buying an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's really when the money's made. So, you know, as a professional real estate investor, somebody has been around a long time. This is the time to sharpen your saw. This is the time for you guys to get ready, uh, get some cash together, pay attention and, and start to look at good and for good deals. Absolutely. And GB said commercial real estate will affect residential when the foreclosures start. Yes, too. correct. It's all kind of interconnected. It's separate, but together. So if you're watching and enjoying what you're seeing, please hit the like button. It really helps us out. Also, this Wednesday, I have a free webinar. I encourage you to sign up for it. It's on passive income, so you can create and maintain multiple flows of income. It's at 5 o'clock Arizona time. Just go to KenMcRoy.com forward slash webinar to check it out. <clears throat> and even if you're not able to be there live, we will send it to you. So make sure you uh, look at that. That's going to be good. Yeah. Well, you guys need to understand how to do it. So, so let's jump into our inner circle questions today. Our first one is from Tony. So Tony is asking, what is a good cash on cash in today's environment? Well, T-Bell, three, three or three month T-Bell is 5%. <laughs> so right. Let's start with that. Right. So it's got to be more than that. Yeah. So, you know, if you're raising money, I would say that it's got to be eight to 10 at mm -hmm. least. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't want, you know, um, you also have to really dig in and make sure the returns you're promised are, you know, realistic too. Yeah, of course, you also get tax advantages and all kinds of things with real estate. So that that's one of the main reasons that you want to invest in it. But um, yeah, I would say, you know, if you don't know all of that, um, you know, or don't have all of that, then just stick with your T-bill for now. Yep, absolutely. Um. Donnie is asking, is there a way to negotiate hard money? Ooh. Because hard money, somebody was asking about hard money in here. Hard money has got very expensive in the last few months. Well, Danielle and I had a great combo about this over the weekend. It, I, I have a very, very good friend that owns a big hard money uh, company out of uh, Arizona. They got offices in Texas, and California. And... Um, they're having a great time right now. So it all boils down to the contract. So normally hard money is short term. Mm -hmm. So the problem becomes when it becomes long term. So um, he told me about one scenario where um, he's lending on a deal where um, the, the guy wasn't able to get permanent debt. And uh, so the hard money kicked in. It's, it's just like a rate cap issue, you know, guys, where the rate caps are your mortgage payment is a lot higher than what you thought it was going to be. And so, he, you know, he's getting killed every month and he's not getting the value that he thought because the it's a retail center. Uh, you know, the retail center is not doing as well. Um, and so the value's down because the cap rates are up and the hard money's kicking in and it's killing him, you know, killing all his liquidity. So um, uh, to answer the question directly, it's going to depend on the hard money guy, but the, I don't know very many that are negotiating that are dropping their rates. Well, they're actually being a lot pickier. So, you know, I know people trying to get into hard money and hard money is literally just saying, no, we're not interested in that <laughs> deal, which was unheard. I mean, hard money always did the deal, but I had talked to some hard money investors and they're starting to get some deals back. And so now they're being more oh. careful in what they actually want to invest in. I should call Mike back and ask him that question because when I talked to him last, it, uh, he said in they're very rarely do they take back any paper or take the asset back. So mm -hmm. I, um, anyway, I think, um, like banks, people are starting to get picky on what they want to invest in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause they know that they're, they don't want it back, but there's a chance they'll have to take it back. Our friend that we talked to at uh, that dinner party was saying, you know, he had a, a property too, that he was going to have to take back and he's trying to do extensions because he doesn't want it, Yeah, but that might be what it comes down to, you know? Yeah. It's a negotiation. If you're with a sophisticated, hard money guy, you might not, um, you're going to get what you're going to get. Yeah. Oh no, they're not, they don't play around. They set the rules and you just follow them. Yeah. This is when you actually pull the document out and see what it says. 
Yeah, right. Um, so we have a little bit of a um, pushback here from Straight Drive. Ooh, good. He said there is record low inventory. Why would the prices crash if sellers are so well positioned and they really don't want to sell? I just don't see these crash predictions. It's all wishful thinking. Oh, well, just follow the math. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Now, we do you think it's going to be like another 08? No. Okay. No, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't think I said there's going to be a crash. Right. I said that there's going to be less people that can buy and uh, rates are going to hold or go up. Mm -hmm. And and it's already starting. You know, if, if you just look, just look, <laughs> what's going on along the coasts? Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, we have we have a little bit of so Justin's like supply is coming, so we're getting a little bit of oh, feistiness, real estate feisty it. talk over right, here. This is good. This is good. You know, <laughs> guys, we don't have a crystal ball either, but right. uh, I will tell you if you if you take a look at uh, the coasts, specifically the West Coast, mm -hmm. which is where I'm from, uh, you're going to see a very different picture than the f the first guy. Um, and then, but if you look at some of the other areas, like. Texas, uh, North Carolina, Florida, and Arizona, as an example, you're going to see more stability. Uh, and by the way, th I'm being very general there because yeah. Flagstaff's different than Phoenix, which is different than Tucson, which is different than Orlando, which is different than Miami, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the point. Yep. And Minor Threat says some states and cities are down 20 to 30% already. And Justin says, look at new construction starts. Ooh, yeah, that's a good indicator. There are there aren't many. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there are people basically, you know, are the people that are in the middle of it are finishing, yeah. but there's not a lot starting. And some aren't even finishing. <laughs> yeah, 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 on commercial and residential. Yeah, so just look, guys, like uh, on a on a piece of dirt with nothing built, you're not getting a fixed rate debt. It's a floater. Mm -hmm. So if you started building something a year ago, you're in, you know your your debt payments a lot more. So that's happening. And, and so, you know, if you're if you're the builder or the contractor or whatever, you, you know, you're you're uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough time. Well, and so GB says no crash. Check the ETFs. Ooh. And Ira says, why would prices go down? High rates, lower supply because less investment in production. Unless people are so broke, they're forced to have roommates. So, oh, well, we, we got another one here. This is oh, good. That is good. I agree with straight dive. When it comes to residential and single family, the biggest thing impacting inventory is everyone has a two and a half percent locked in rate and they're becoming landlords rather than selling. And that's what we actually really hope that you all are doing. I, I do think that a lot of people, they really like even my brother, like they want to use that money when they move for that down payment. Like that down payment yeah. money is like so enticing to them that they don't want to be a landlord. But with these low rates and these new rates, you know, maybe like a lot of people probably are that wouldn't yeah. have expected well, to be. I said it before, you know, if you have a 2% or 3% loan, that loan is an asset. Yeah. Period. So I think I agree with him that you're not going to move out of that and, and get a loan at seven or eight percent. You're not. Yeah. You're going to hold. And now maybe your equity holds. Maybe it doesn't. And time will tell. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, we're going to wrap a little early today. Ken has a meeting that he has to no, attend. I have a Zoom call with George Gammon. Okay, He's he calling has a in Zoom from call. Columbia. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah, Jerry and Steve and I went over that, you know, earlier. <laughs> well, I kind of was running in late per usual. I got here two minutes still. So. I, know, I know, but uh, sorry to cut it off a little bit, guys. But uh, if you have any issues or questions, please send those in. We'll try to get those answered uh, for you before next week. And uh, as always, I appreciate you watching. I love the debate too. Um, Guys, I do not want a real estate crash. I want to, I do not want but one. Please let us know in the comments if you see a real estate crash coming or not. Cause I think that would be really interesting. So we can kind of tally up who sees the crash and who does not. That could be a good little survey. Yeah, let's wow. do it. Comment Jerry, under. Get on that. All right. All see right. you guys next week. <laughs> see you guys. Cheers.